Hello and welcome to Pandemic Podcast for Educators. My name's Gawain. I'm Karam. And I'm Erica. This week we're going to be talking about the rising case rates in the north of England. We've seen a huge rise in case rates in the northwest and now also the northeast going into mm -hmm. further lockdown in many areas. And I'm really pleased today we've got our special guest, Vic Chechi Ribeiro, with us. Vic is uh, the lead rep for a chain of schools across the north of England. Uh, Vic, you're really, really welcome to join us today. Please make sure so you don't miss any episodes, do click the subscribe button down at the bottom of the screen. So uh, this massive explosion of cases in the north of England, it's, it's really worrying, isn't it? Karim, you've been an independent sage. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Yeah, uh, so I'm just going to share a picture um i there we go so here is the um latest heat map so as you can see um over the course of the course of the last week we've got a large increase of those hot spots um looking at three different measures they suggested that if the rate of infection is uh doubling every eight days at the moment in march it was doubling every four days and they believe that at the current trajectory we'll have the same infection level in not at the start of October as we did at the end of March. So they are calling for quick action. Wow, so these are really significant rises, aren't they? A, a real change, and you can see on that map there that it's very much focused on those patches uh, northeast there and, and in the northwest. Um, so Vic, you teach in the northwest, America, you're in the northeast. Um, can you tell me a bit, Vic, first of all, about what, what's the impact in your area? What does it mean? Yeah, so it sort of means uh, different things in different ways. No, just on a personal level, just not being able to mix with different households since the end of August. Um, but at the same time, if those same friends or family, if I worked with them in an office or went to school with them, I'd be able to see, be able to see them. So you know, it's, it's really highlighted the government's priorities and it you know, seems to be um, like making profit and money. Like, for example, if I had a card reader, in this living room would not be able to have people over here um in school um you know, things we've been saying for months you know the need to add an effective testing system um you know the need to we've had months to pursue a zero covid strategy you know near things have happened we've had now of schools with thousands of people and unsurprisingly we're seeing cases rise so it's, it's sort of concerning and like i said it means different things in different ways at the moment yeah. I mean, it really does, like you say, it really highlights the weakness of the government strategy. I mean, they had something like six months to prepare for the reopening of schools. And yet we're being told it's taken them by surprise, the demand for tests, etc. I mean, the union proposed a clear strategy to them, investing in additional staff, investing in additional space to make sure schools could be safely open. And yet they seem to have ignored all of that. And now we're facing the consequences with these rising case rates. Um, so uh, America, how about you? What's the impact where you are? Oh, uh, it's an odd one where I am at the moment. So there's my area of Stockton and the other sort of areas that make up what was known as Teesside. So Middlesbrough, Hartlepool, Wigger and Cleveland sometimes include Darlington. Sometimes it's not. I don't know why, but we like Darlington. We'll include Darlington. Um, we're like this little island at the moment, mm -hmm. almost of freedom, um, directly not, to the north. You've not gone into lockdown yet? No, no. Okay. So directly to the north of us, we've got seven local authorities um, who have re-entered a lockdown situation. So the likes of Durham, Newcastle, Gateshead, North and South Tyneside, Northumberland, Sunderland, I knew I was missing one. Um, who are now in that lockdown situation then there's us not doing that and then directly to the south of us we've got north yorkshire who have declared like a state of emergency for the impact that it's having on their emergency services right and then directly to the east of me i've got middlesbrough who's on the government watch list not entered any formal lockdown and this weekend middlesbrough football clubs allowing a thousand spectators into the stadium to watch the match against Bournemouth um which strikes me as a bit bizarre 
because they're on a government watch list and whilst you can probably socially distance a thousand people within such a huge stadium once they're seated how are you going to sort out the turnstiles and getting them through the little corridors and stuff to actually get there in the first place well, it, and apart from anything else it just seems a real lack of joined up thinking yeah i mean i, I guess this is a result isn't it of years of Tory cuts fragmentation that mean local authorities don't have the power to coordinate these things anymore they don't have the resources to coordinate them they're trying to look after schools but you've got all these other events going on neighboring local authorities not able to coordinate with each other I, yeah i mean middlesbrough Lo middlesbrough council have been put in um, two free face masks through everybody's door, mm -hmm. which is you know, good. It's, it's a welcome thing. But at the same time, if there's other things such as like a mass gathering, which is essentially what a thousand people in one place is, and like half an hour down the road in Durham, you can't even go and see your grandparents. It's a little bit odd. I, I, I just don't think it's sensical at all um also it doesn't really take into account that you could have people in your family that live in a different local authority so you might have someone who's able to go and see like their sister because they live in teesside but they can't go visit the mum who lives in durham um but they can go to a football match with 999 other people yeah yeah, okay. So, so it, is, it is that lack of joined up thinking. And I guess our role during this is to do our damnedest, as I know every educator is, try and keep schools yeah. open, keep education provided for kids, um, whilst at the same time trying to make sure the case rate is reduced. So how do we go about that? What, what are the kind of strategies we should be adopting as, as trade unions in this context? Um, well, I think... I'll now, a good place to start is you now really developing that presence at a school level. You now, where we were really strong as a union, um, you know, throughout the pandemic is you know, where we've got strong school union groups, we've been able to have members coming together, collectivising their issues, and our union checklist is really, really powerful in, in terms of that. I think a similar approach now would be really important, you know, be it whether there's a certain number of cases um, in, in an area and that might then lead to a wider conversation around those members of staff who are clinically vulnerable or extremely clinically vulnerable having the option to um, work from home because you know, we do want schools to be open and that's why we you know, made those demands um, Steve about five six months ago in terms of what would keep schools open so what's going to be really key now is as a trade unionist what can we do now to develop that that local school presence, what can we do around organising around health and safety um, moving forward? Yeah, because there are quite a few concrete measures could be put in place in schools as case rates rise, aren't there? There there's, is that whole question of clinically vulnerable and clinically extremely vulnerable people. The latter group we've always said should be able to work from home, but maybe as case rates are rising, we should be looking at clinically vulnerable staff in our schools. But also simple things like, I know some schools have gone to positions where they're not enforcing directed time. So staff are in for their contact time with the students, but then they're able to go so that you're minimizing the amount of contact adults are having by not keeping people around in the building after the students have gone for, uh, for INSEP, CPD and so on, not holding staff meetings, gatherings like that. I mean, there are a whole load of measures, aren't there, that could be one at a school level which will help keep the school open, but the case rates down. Yeah, I, I think it's a case of, you mentioned directed time, it's, you know, it's united, united those things around health and safety. So for example, if you've got member staff who are off, um, we'll talk about this later about, because they might be waiting for a test. Um, yeah. That means the, you know, the remaining staff might have an increased workload. And then you might see member staff you know, feeling run down, overworked, which might then lead to um, further absences. So as trade unions, the challenge for us is really you know, popularising demands around health and safety and uniting those, those sort of different struggles. Definitely. And you talked about uniting there. So I think there's something else about linking up across those areas. So some areas like uh, Bolton, for example, I know the case rate is through the roof. In areas like that, I think it it's going to be worth people linking up across schools, isn't it? Obviously in a, in a virtual socially distanced way, but the idea of I mean, I think now's the point where we need to be coordinating the reps across those areas, get the branches coordinating those reps, bringing them together to share the experience of different schools. 
and and to start to um, start to try and work with the local authority, with Public Health England, with all of those partners to put the right measures in place. At the end of the day, we want schools open, but the case rates down. That's that's got to be the key. And and hopefully, all of those authorities will be willing to work with us to get those measures in place. Yeah, and during the pandemic, what our districts were really good at was sort of creating WhatsApp group for reps. What I think the challenge now is moving from that, where it can be a bit one-stop shop, asking questions, receiving an answer, and being a bit transactional towards it, getting more of an organising focus. So you're moving from having, say, a WhatsApp group to actually then having you know, quite a rank-and-file profile in district meetings where sort of the make of that meeting is, you know, those reps giving district secretaries an idea of what's happening on the ground sort of what's the safety like in these schools and you can then use that sort of creative and sort of collective understanding of what's happening on the ground and take that to local authority meetings so you've got more of a democratic um, um more of a democratic sort of nature to sort of our union structures yeah yeah yeah, so, 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 so using that as an organic way of bringing people together in order to find collective responses to it. And I guess, you know, uh, many of us have been to union meetings where, you know, you've got the set agenda of things that you always discuss. I mean, times like this, surely that's got to be out the window. The focus has to be on what is the position on the ground? What do we think the solutions are? What are we going to do about it collectively? Have you, uh, America, you're a local secretary. Have you seen a shift like that in terms of the way you're working locally and bringing members together? Yeah, we're trying to. Anyway, I mean, um, trying to build rep density is always pretty much the top of my agenda next yeah, to care work. Um, but yeah, definitely. It's something that we've been discussing within our region for quite a while anyway, is how to adopt more of an organising approach because top down doesn't work. We need a grassroots members getting in touch, telling us what, what it is that they need and helping them to then become involved to help us sort the problem. So it's not just somebody like Vic was saying, you can't just have it as a transactional thing. It needs to be both ways. Yeah. Ka Karen, what, what about in your patch? Do you have success kind of negotiating winning things from the local authority? You're in, you're we, in that we've had, here, aren't you? Yeah, we've had, we've had quite a few. There's one that I may speak about later, but there's one that has actually just come into my head, which is an issue that's arisen in the last couple of days from from the grassroots members and we've we've collectivized that and we're now uh, negotiating a solution with the council and that is on um specialist transport for SEND pupils to specialist schools we've had a real issue with actually them being able to get to school um particularly mm -hmm. those with uh, medical with uh physical with physical disabilities who then need extra ways of getting them on or onto the school coach and off and that hasn't been provided properly and the attendance rate has dropped massively in several in several schools in the area and we are now going going to see that uh, remedied o over the next couple of days by the looks of it which has been really positive and actually quite rapid in the response and how quickly it's going um the relationships with council are are definitely definitely very good at the moment because because of the to and fro between us that's yeah. good we've had um a little win well not little it's a good win um with one of our multi-academy trusts within in our little little idyllic patch of Teesside um over the past couple of days we had members get in touch saying that they were concerned that they wouldn't be paired um because their children were having to self-isolate as a result of their secondary school having like a bubble that was closed what have you or their primary having a bubble that was closed um not necessarily the members school but the school that their children attend so we have had a win in a mat um where they have agreed to pay all those members for being at home and looking after their children they've, they've accepted and said themselves actually it's exceptional circumstances so members are happy with that and that's great because that's come from the members and our lead rep for that trust put that forward to to the head of the mat and they they were already amazingly on that wavelength, but we've had that conversation, that dialogue, and we've got that win. So we're hoping that we can roll that model out. I've got a meeting with the local authority coming up, and I'm hoping that we can use that as good practice and get that in place for everybody, which is great, which actually leads me on to another point. Childcare. Um, childcare in general. So 
you may have noticed that there are seven local authorities that have just entered a lockdown situation within the North East. Um, so from following along on the, on the WhatsApp groups, because obviously my LA isn't one of those seven, but the poor people in those areas who rely on family members to look after their children so that they can go to work. So with, with the new rules that are, are in place, you can't have someone from another household in your household. Right. So, so, so these informal childcare arrangements with the families yeah, are, are going to break down. You can't have it. So say, like, if I had hypothetical children and I needed my parents to look after those hypothetical children, they couldn't. Right, so which immediately can't... is going to, immediately that's going to impact yeah. on the number of members of staff available for work, not just in education, but Absolutely. right across the pitch, NHS yeah. workers whose parents look after their children, uh, a whole range of people impacted by yeah, it. It's... Surely, it, surely something's got to be done about that. Are, are people taking action over it? What, oh, what, they are indeed. Um, as, as we speak, Durham are having a meeting, an emergency meeting with all of their members about it, and Durham's joint district secretary and branch secretary emma has been writing a letter to gavin williamson and matt hancock um basically calling for that part of it to to be removed so that childcare can happen otherwise everything is going to fall apart well, um, it's just not joined up thinking is it our members no, want to be not. in school they want to be teaching children and yet you put measures in place that make it impossible for them yeah the, the thing as well which gets me is that they're allowing um like private childcare to still go ahead so if it's yeah. like a registered childminder or private nursery so why the think that your child would be safer in a setting with a number of other children from various households but not in the household of someone in your own family it, it sounds like it's, it's just not bit... been thought through doesn't it mm, like, no sense it of... is and uh, i think it's already having an impact um so one of our, our colleagues in the northern region was saying this morning that she's a supply teacher and she's told her supply agency that she's not usually available for on the day work it needs mm -hmm. to be pre-booked but this morning uh, you know the first morning of this lockdown situation where people can't get childcare hmm, she was receiving calls for on the day work which tells me one thing having had worked for agencies they're desperate for teach supply teachers to be able to go into settings which will mean you know that the staff unable to go to work because there is no childcare so we're calling for that to be you know sorted out not no, just I, in education but across the board I, I think that's really really important I, I want to return to your earlier point though because you were talking there about a win for parents whose children have symptoms and therefore mm. they th those people obviously can't go in we're not talking there about them being able yeah. to go to childcare or something if they've got symptoms they need to be self-isolating their parents mm. will need to be at home um yep. there need to be arrangements in place for that because if if um if those members of staff aren't on full pay if they're moved on to sick pay or or even worse has to take unpaid leave um all kinds of dangerous things you know people are going to ignore symptoms or miss them because they sim simply can't afford to do it what mm. what's the position like in your chain Vic have, have you come across this as an issue yeah it's, it's come up over the last couple of weeks unsurprisingly in response to the rising number of cases so we're, we're still in negotiation with our with our matt about it um what they what they've said is to extend the number of emergency childcare leave days our point is that no, these are unique times and there should be no natural detriment to, to any work, particularly those who you know, are protected characteristic. There may be a single working mother, for example, or you know, we sort of spoke about unable to get sort of other childcare as well. So that's sort of something that we've looked at. We've also um, suggested that the first point of call should be working from home because if you are working from home, then there should be no question around leave. You are yeah. working, you should be paid. So sort of, we sort of expect proportionately as staff go off, children will go off so there'll be things like setting work online marking it online there's always stuff around you know with the many changes with offsets around curriculum and schema and sequencing um, schemes of work and things like that so there's plenty of work to do but but also it presents another organizing opportunity so what we can say to our members is you no know, you need to be in a school with a union rep because the only way you're going to win on this is if, if you organize in your school so that presents a lot of opportunities in terms of 
getting workplaces to map where their members are, look to increase their member density, and also a real powerful way to have organised a conversation with someone who may not have been active in their union. Well, you simply say to them, you know, we've got members meeting coming up to talk about childcare. Now, the only way that you're going to be able to get paid childcare is that if we all come together, collectivise this issue and, and win on it as well. So potentially, there's a real powerful means of increasing our strength in the workplace from it. Yeah, no, I, I think really good points there because once you once you build that power in the workplace, then you, you're in a much better position to negotiate over a whole range of issues, both to keep the workplace safe, but also going forward to improve education in the workplace, to improve terms and conditions and so on. So I, I think really, really important. So that can happen at a workplace at a single employer level. Um, how about you, Karen? What, what, what's the position in, in your local authority across the authority? So, so what we... Yeah, what we've what we've found since the COVID since the COVID crisis began, we've we've been working increasingly closely with the local authorities. Um, the relationship now is very is very good, very responsive. I think, and knowing some fr some friends who sit uh, who are councillors in the next district over, I think a lot of councillors feel like us. They they feel overwhelmed, and the idea of having that expertise to talk is is really appreciated by them as well. We uh, about last week. Um, we got an array agreement with the local authority. Um, they have drawn it up into policy that staff should be receive full pay um, if they need to isolate for any reason. Um, and that has now been sent out to all local authority schools and has been sent to uh, academy head teachers as well. So as far as we're concerned, it should be resolved. A few cases that have come up, because I'm in an area of low infection at the moment, all the <coughs> few cases that have come up, they're, they're, they're receiving their pay as things right. stand. So, so, so this is a really good. important thing listeners could pick up now, isn't it? If, if, if you need to check in your workplace, is this a situation? What happens if people have to isolate because their children have symptoms? Um, is there something in place? And if not, get together with the other workers in your, in your workplace, get together with your colleagues, organise to win that because that's such an important protection for so many people. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're talking there about children who may have symptoms and they're off. Now, obviously, the key thing you want to do, my, my daughter was ill earlier in the week. She had a couple of days off school. And, and, and the first thing you're thinking is there may be some symptoms there. I want to get a test to make sure that everything's all right. Now, sounds simple. It's obviously the place you go. Here are the symptoms. Get a test. If it's negative, my child can be back in school. We've minimised the disruption. We've kept people in school. Same for staff members. Um, if the test comes back positive, we've identified there's a risk. We're able to put the track and trace in place and all of that. But there's a huge problem. So as, as I said, I was just checking out earlier. It turned out that she didn't have all of the symptoms, so we didn't need to go as far as getting a test. But I checked just to find out where my nearest test would be if I had to get a tested. Now, I live in a city, not in the middle of nowhere. I live in Norwich, but the nearest test available was in Peterborough. Now, that's 67 miles away. That is a, an hour and 45 minute drive. So we're talking, what, a three and a half hour round trip in order to get a test. Now, surely that cannot be right. I, I mean, it, it, it's like the entire system is just completely useless and i know we're seeing this right across the country uh, what's the situation in your areas and, and and why has the government been so incapable of pulling together a testing system that works oh you're definitely not alone in having to travel stupid distances to be able to get something um one of our our fellow secretaries within in the northeast had to have a test this week and she was eventually from Middlesbrough given um, a test centre in Manchester. Middlesbrough yeah. to Manchester? Yeah, that That's was the nearest third, one. isn't it? Um, <laughs> are, you able to get a test, are you able to get a test in Manchester, Vic, or do you have to go to Middlesbrough to get one? Well, uh, if you try in Manchester, it just doesn't tell you where to go. Um, I think it was Burton, actually, but bizarre, if you put Oldham in, um, then you get a test in Accrington, which is a 86 mile wow. round trip. Um, but it's just really emblematic. And I don't think it's incompetency. It's just the fact that we've had the hollowing out of public services and our you know, institution. They're just no joined up way of thinkers. It's all run by profit and outsourcing. Actually, 
the, the challenge for, for us as trade unions is you know, the outsourcing in education, which is academization, fragmentation, that's put its own problems mm. in terms of fragmentation um, in the system. You know, for example, cleaning staff being outsourced for profit. You no, know, many cleaners out of school don't have access to sick pay or lack of PPE. So what we need to be able to do is link the chaos and the outsourcing in testing with the chaos and the outsourcing mm. in the education system and in wider society. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's true. If you've set up a system where your aim is not actually, your primary aim isn't actually to provide a test for all the people that need it, your primary aim is to make profit from it. And that's the mm. basis on which you... T- I mean, people talk about competition, improving results. Look at the testing system. It's, it's not working. Um, no. but it's if literally you not working. The, the website doesn't work properly. There was a thing I saw in Schools Week yesterday where it was saying about how the, the front end interface of the, the test and dress website where you book a test doesn't quite communicate properly with its database. And that's probably why there's such a discrepancy in like where it's telling you to go and get a test. So they haven't had, well, I think they've rushed it. Yeah. They've, they've admitted given the amount of time that they've it. had to develop it, you know, they've rushed it and it's not been tested. Huh. The test Properly. hasn't been tested. Yeah, the Don't test hasn't been tested. Yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, they've, they've, they've now admitted that the coding wasn't tested beforehand. So we've got another mutant algorithm at loose on the rest of our, on this country. Um, on, yeah, uh, the current contact, according to Independent Says, they, they've been looking at the analysis of the um, test and trace. And at the moment, the efficiency rate of contact tracing is 16%. Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent, and then they've uh, and then they're extrapolating that actually, if they could just get it up to thirty percent efficiency, that would actually have a big, a big impact on driving down infections. So they don't even need a well-beaten one; they just need something that works. Well, yeah. Can you imagine if we we told? like leadership in our school oh yeah only 16 percent of our children have made progress this year that's that's acceptable right i mean it it is it (laughs) is just absurd isn't it and whilst our members are going out of their way excessive workload in order to keep schools open Mm. doing everything they can case rates rising around them and the government can't put in place a testing system that works and we've said this since the very beginning of this crisis when we first established the five tests we said a working test track and trace system was absolutely essential we said it to government over the summer we said it when we came back in september we said teachers support staff all our members want to be back in schools and colleges but there needs to be a decent testing system in place and they still haven't managed it. And the fact is, if case rates continue to rise and schools end up going to rotors part-time or closing, it will be because the government has messed this up. And every step of the way, we've done everything we can to try and make it work. So maybe there's another action for our listeners to take. I know that uh, the leadership of the union has written to Boris Johnson to say what needs to be done immediately. But we need to pile a pressure on, don't we, to our MPs, uh, to the prime minister, to the education secretary, that actually this system needs sorting. Our members are going to work every single day to try and sort out this mess that the government Mm. has created. And they need to they need to pull themselves together and get a testing system in place. Yeah, we're not, uh, did you see the, um, they've released the priority testing list and education staff are not on the priority list for testing now that they're they're bringing the testing. Well, that is just ridiculous. How are we supposed to keep schools open if we're we're not even on the priority list for tests? It's, yeah, it's frankly ridiculous. Um, We are coming close to time. Go on, Karen, one more point and then I'm going to find the question to wrap up. And even if they're not concerned about health and they're only concerned about the economy, if all the teachers end up being off, then there's then they're going to have to go to partial closures, which means people won't be able to go to work. So there will be an economic impact of teachers not going and it will be in the billions. Yeah. yeah. No, and they definitely no. won't be able to go to work if they can't even send the kids to the grandparents' house to look after them because they're in a local lockdown. 
Yeah, so too many things there that need sorting and ultimately it's the government that needs to do that. So the union's going to keep putting the pressure on. But my, my final question for each of you is, um, what should our listeners be doing? What should they be doing now in their workplace, in their local area to try and sort out as much of this mess as they can um, that the government's made? Uh, let's go to uh, Vic first. What should our members be doing? What's the key? The, the, the key for our members is to you know, unity of strength between you know, the workers in, in the school um, as ever, as the ones who um, are on the front line. You know, the argument made that teaching and being in education generally is one of the most dangerous jobs at the moment, is, is to come together. If you are in a school without a union rep, you know, come together, elect, it's never been more important. Um, become active trade unionists, meet regularly at least every half term and follow up with a meeting with your head teacher, set up a negotiating cycle, um, you know, get involved with your district as well. So you feed into the union's wider uh, democratic structure because when we build our collective strength on things like health and safety, it's incredibly important now we can start winning on other things like points related page, I believe was a previous episode you covered. Um, we start, you know, start building sort of education system that workers, learners and our community deserve. Thanks, Vic. Excellent. Merica, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, come quite nicely on from what Vic said. Get in touch with your branch. If there are any issues whatsoever that you are facing as a result of this absolute farcical testing situation, get in touch with your branch. They're the ones who've got the bargaining rights with your local authority or your mat, and they will be able to have your back and try and get something in place for you, a bit like the wins that we discussed earlier. Brilliant. And Karim, do you want to add to um, that? Yeah, in, in my workplace, um, now that we're three weeks into term, we are going to be having a safety and workload inventory, which will be uh, start off with a survey um, that I'm, I will be writing with HR and the other union and, and the head teacher as well. And that will go out and then we're going to shift through all of those responses and see what we can tweak because workload is also an issue on health as well. We don't want people getting run down and getting all coldy as well, do we? So we're having a yeah. whole whole staff collaboration to look at improving practices. Excellent. Okay, so the key message is get organised in your workplace, get involved in your branch, play a role locally in that collective as well. And unity is strength. Together as a union, we will protect our education system, the students that we serve and their families. Thank you so much for joining us. And please do remember to subscribe so you don't miss an issue. Thank you to our special guests today, Vic and America and Karim. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Solidarity.